Hi guys, uh, here's part three of the video. As you can see, it's now daytime and I've changed outfits because I was recording part two and part one really late at night, a couple nights ago, and I was falling asleep. So, let's continue with this uh, literary analysis PowerPoint. Uh, so we left off on structure. So how a story is structured. Something that you guys should be familiar with is how a story is formatted and this is a story not only in literature but also in films because every story follows the same pattern so how is the story structured well there's three main parts there's the exposition the beginning of the story where the characters and settings setting are introduced the rising action where the main character faces a series of conflicts and then the climax of the story where the most exciting part of the story when we learn the outcome. So this major fight scene or a major revelation, the climax of the story, where everything after that is considered falling action. Events leading to the end of the story, wrapping it all up, and then the resolution, the end of the story. But these three main parts are usually the parts that you are going to be analyzing when you're doing a literary analysis because the exposition has the characters, the setting, and conflict three areas that you can analyze. Rising action, conflict and suspense. Conflict is a major thing that a lot of people analyze when doing literary analysis. And then the climax is when the conflict is at its peak. So it's a really great source of information and dialogue and plot points and characterization. Uh, to use for when you are doing your literary analysis. <clears throat> so let's go into the types of conflict into a deeper uh, in, in deeper uh, a deeper idea. So there's different types of conflict and these are just four of them. Uh, if you ever take my myth class we'll go into conflict in unit five unit four, unit four. Um, and there, you find that there's even more uh, types of conflicts than these four, but these are the four that are really just uh, the main ones that are usually used in literature. So there's person versus person conflict. So events typically focus on differences in values, experiences, and attitudes. Uh, so Harry Potter versus Voldemort, uh, Katniss Everdeen versus President Coin? Snow, President Snow. And I think President Corn at the end, but yeah, President Snow. And then person versus society conflict. A person is fighting an event, an issue, a philosophy, or a cultural reality that is unfair. So that is, goes back again to Katniss Everdeen fighting the Hunger Games. Because that is an event or um, a cultural reality that is unfair to most of its people. And then person versus nature conflict. The character is often alone dealing with nature in extreme circumstances. So I'm sure you've seen a show with the same name, Man vs. Nature, where the main survivalist guy is fighting against different types of nature and different types of um, conflicts that you might uh, get into if you're ever lost in certain parts of the world by yourself. It's a lot like that, and there's plenty of books that show this too, where, or and movies where man is versing, uh, is going against this nature and trying to survive. And then person versus self conflict. A person is conflicted with childhood memories, unpleasant experiences, or issues with stress and decision making. So, person versus self conflict is person versus um, self. Really breaking it down even simpler and all this stuff that is inside of them and things that they've experienced in the past that might conflict with things in their future. So if they um, had a bad childhood experience with abuse or with um, bullying, any type of thing, and then they're going in the future and that person that bullied them in elementary school is now uh, has now changed and they're now coworkers and they're trying to, uh, the bully is trying to be friends with the person that they bullied because they've changed and they want to, you know, be more of an adult. That person who was bullied might be like, uh, I don't know if I can do this. 
So they're fighting their inner self and their past experiences with what is right in front of them in the present. So let's break down characterization. Some of these words you are already familiar with because we've been using them in our daily vocabulary. So I think we've gone over protagonist, antagonist, dynamic, and static characters. So good, you're already familiar with those. But let's review anyway. Protagonist, it's the main character. Antagonist, character or force that opposes the main character. And when it says force, that means the antagonist can be uh, something that's not technically human or alive. It can be nature. When you go into that conflict about nature versus man, the antagonist can be nature itself. Foil, character that provides a contrast to the protagonist. So a foil character is not the antagonist. It's not uh, contrasting in the way that it's opposing the protagonist, but it's a character that's different in almost every way. It could be the best friend character that uh, just provides uh, that contrast to the protagonist and maybe an outsider view um, or a different view, uh, but still on the same side. Because we all need those friends who have a different perspective that can keep the protagonist in line. Dynamic. So that's the character that changes and grows throughout the story like we discussed. Static. Characters that remain the same does not change at all throughout the story. A lot when we talked about static characters before in our daily vocabulary lesson we talked about how that's a lot of times the antagonist character um, because usually antagonists don't change at all through the stories, at least not in a way that uh, can be seen um, through major growth. Then the flat character, the character is not complete, has one or two striking qualities and that's it. So it's kind of those background characters that add a couple lines here and there but don't really add to the plot at all, but they're kind of filler characters if you will. And then a round character, um, that has more dimension to their personality. So it can still be a background character, but they're more well-rounded. Um, their personality is uh, more broad. So when you're talking about, let's say, a well-rounded person, same thing. They have multiple dimensions. And a black character, um, while it could be a background character, I want to go back to the idea that it could also be a character that just hasn't um, reached its dynamics uh, character uh, changes yet, and it's kind of a flat character, but as they go through the story, they become more of a round character as they grow through personal growth. Alright, direct characterization. The narrator explicitly comes out and tells us things about a character. So, what the character him or himself or herself says, does, thinks, feels, what other char characters specifically tell us about a character. So the character has brown hair, brown eyes, is funny, is really mean, is a bully. The descriptions straight up saying this is what they are, this is who they are, and this is what they think because maybe they're the narrator in it, uh, in the book. So you get their thoughts right away and they're thinking, hey, this person is a really cool person. And then you know that they think that person is a really cool person. So straightforward, exact characterization. No reading between the lines. Indirect characterization. Um, this is a lot, um, or this is the main thing that you could write an argument about when you're taught if you choose characterization. So this is what you can make arguable because you can't argue direct characterization because if they say that their hair is brown, of course their hair is brown. You can't argue that. But indirect, you can work with. You can argue. So, indirect characterization, think about steel. Speech, thoughts, effects on others, others' feelings about the character, actions, and looks. So, speech, what does the character say? How does the character speak? I know we said before that sometimes direct characterization can come from what someone says, but there's different ways that you can say things. You know how you say, uh, sometimes, oh yeah, I'm fine, when someone asks you how you are, but you're not really fine, you're just, don't want to really tell you what you're really feeling, that can be indirect characterization. Thoughts, what is revealed through the character's private thoughts and feelings? 
So again, this can be direct characterization. Hey, I think this person is cool. But it could also be the train of thought that they're going through. You can, while they're not saying it directly out, oh, I think this person is cool, or I think this person is pretty, this person might be thinking uh, about certain facial features or such, which is indirect, but you can kind of assume, oh, they think this character is pretty attractive because of how they're thinking about their eyes or their hair or whatnot. And then effects on others and others' feelings about the characters. What is revealed through the character's effect on people? How do other people, characters feel or behave in reaction to the character? So, this is very indirect because a lot of times you can get an idea of how people think of someone by how they react to them without them saying, oh, I think this person is really great, or oh, I'm scared of this person. That can be how they react to them. So maybe, um, if a person is standing really, really close to someone else, but they don't say, oh yeah, I'm, you know, on their side. If they're standing right next to them and they're nodding along to what they're saying, they're pretty much, you can pretty much assume indirectly that that character is uh, affected positively by that other character that they are standing close to. They agree with what they're saying. They agree with what they're doing. They trust them. Actions. What does the character do? How does the character behave? So this is indirect because they're not fully, the narrator can't fully say, or maybe the narrator is a, the main character and they're seeing an action of someone, but they're not saying, oh, this person's horrible, but they are describing through their narration that this character is um, calling someone a name or um, you know, kicking rocks at the little short guy or the new kid. And while they're not saying they're bullying, they're just describing their actions, you can pretty much assume indirectly that this character, not a nice character. <laughs> and then looks, what does the character look like? How does the character dress? So again, this can be a direct thing. Oh, hey, this person has brown hair, brown eyes. But then it can go back to the idea that how someone dresses can describe indirectly maybe their station in life or uh, what they do for a living. So while you don't say, oh, this guy is a mechanic, you can describe the jumpsuit that a lot of mechanics wear. And then people assume, oh, this guy's a mechanic or this girl's a mechanic. But um, without actually saying the words, hey, this person does this for a living. And then also you can say, uh, describe clothes as raggedy and a person as dirty and um, unwashed. And you can maybe consider, hey, maybe this person is homeless um, without the uh, narrator actually saying this person is homeless. All right, so setting. What to consider? Time period, geographical location, historical and cultural context. So what is the... What are the people going through socially, politically, and spiritually? Because as history changes and how the time period changes and the geographical location changes, so does the social interactions, the political interactions, and the spiritual interactions. And then why do we consider this? It is instrumental in establishing a mood, may symbolize the emotional state of characters, and impacts on characters' motivations and options. So the motivation, if a person, let's say, is spiritually inclined towards Christianity and then another character is spiritually not spiritual at all, like atheist or something, they're motivated differently because religion might be important to the Christianity and uh, the Christian person or the Christian character and they're backed up by that and that's what motivates them. This atheist while they might be motivated towards the same thing, it's not religion that's motivating them. So this video is almost done. Um, so I'm going to stop this recording and then we'll pick up for a point of view. I'm really sorry we're getting into a fourth video, but we only have a few slides left. So the last video is going to be really short. Uh, again, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stay tuned.